Assassin's Creed Valhalla is here, and there's a whole lot to talk about. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 things Assassin's Creed Valhalla doesn't tell you. Starting off with number 10, and when you are starting out, you're gonna need a lot of combat tips. First off, not a bad idea to equip a shield in your second hand. You might be tempted to put another axe and do a wield, mm -mm. at least while you're getting the hang of things. It's not a bad idea to just stick with a shield. Death can come in second, so playing defensively is always pretty smart, and parry timing for shields is a lot more forgiving than literally any other weapon in the game. Yes, you can parry with anything, two-handed weapons included, but you'll need to master the timing or you won't survive long. If you screw up a parry with a shield, you'll still block the attack, but if you mess up a parry with a weapon, you're going to take damage, which is a lot bigger of a risk. Basically, once you start to understand how different enemies attack, then you can transition to more advanced weapons that require precise timing for parries. Another thing to keep in mind, dual wielding doesn't double your attack damage. You only do the damage of the weapon in your main hand. So what's the point of dual wielding? Well, it does make it so you can perform a special ability by holding down the block button. Just tapping it makes you perform a parry, but holding it down activates the weapon's special ability. So truthfully, some are pretty handy and some are really not handy. It's definitely worth experimenting with, but keep in mind, it's not always better to have two weapons. And having this knowledge might direct you towards the shield, especially if you don't really care for the weapon abilities. The game has an actual stamina meter, this Dark Souls style stamina meter, that type of thing. That means you dodge too much, you'll run out of stamina, and you'll become extremely vulnerable for a few seconds while it recharges. Now, the interesting thing is that your stamina is dependent on your weight. If you've only got one weapon equipped and nothing in your offhand, you will have a lot more stamina than if you have a weapon and a shield or two weapons. From our experience so far, it doesn't make a huge difference, but it is worth keeping in mind as you're doing your calculations. Here's a big one though, fire is bad. Raiding inevitably leads to a lot of fire, like you're not avoiding that, but try to avoid getting caught on fire. Cause if you are on fire, it will do damage very quickly. Uh, to put it out, you need to hold down the dodge button and do a big roll. Just tapping won't work. You have to do a full on roll to put out the flames. Another good thing to do is augment your close range combat with a bow. This game adds the powerful ability to shoot the enemy's weak spot, which is denoted by this yellow slash orange glow. If you manage to hit all of them, they will stagger the enemy and leave them vulnerable to a bigger attack. Like for a regular enemy, this would probably mean instant death. And for most bosses, big chunk of their health, still very helpful, obviously. But once you get the hang of it, you're probably gonna be able to take out a lot more enemies very quickly, putting yourself in at least less harm's way. Or hey, be a true Viking warrior and equip a shield in both hands. I don't know why you would do this, but you can. And number nine, this probably sounds extremely obvious, but some skills are better than others. See, the skill tree in this game is really big and there is a lot to look out for, so let's talk about some of the skills that are particularly useful. One of the best skills to get early is advanced assassinations. This makes it so you can do additional assassination damage to high-level targets, like there's an additional QTE, it's not too hard or anything, you'll get the hang of it pretty quick. And being able to kill these guys who you couldn't kill instantly before, very helpful. Another really useful skill is the counter roll. It lets you roll over an enemy's back and attack them from behind when they perform unblockable attacks. Definitely a tactical advantage. For certain enemies, like ones with shields or just really tough dudes, this can be really helpful. Because remember, you do additional damage and stagger damage when you hit an enemy's back. It's way to the left on the skill tree, just keep going left. Outside of those, another really useful one is break fall which, guess, it makes it so you don't take fall damage. If you played previous games like Odyssey, you know exactly why this is a really useful skill. The game doesn't have a lot of stuff that can break your fall like in previous Assassin's Creed games. Less people are just leaving their hay sitting around, I guess. So a lot of the time, the only way to get down off a high mountain or something is to slowly climb down. With this skill, hey, just jump off, why not? I mean, it's ridiculous that a little roll makes it so a 10,000 foot drop doesn't kill you, but who cares? Play this game enough and you will be begging for the skill. There are cliffs everywhere. And remember, you can always respec your skill points at no cost. So you can experiment with skills as much as you want. Hell, if you want to put all your points into stealth for a certain mission, but the next mission calls for a lot of combat, you can just respec all those points towards fighting. There's nothing stopping you from just putting points in a manner simply to reveal the full skill tree. If you really just want to know what the entire tree looks like, it's not really that hard. And number eight, how to get the most out of raiding, which is, by the way, a key component of the game. 
There's a few things you can do to make it a bit easier, especially when taking on locations that are higher level than you. Like, you don't have to just roll in with all your guys and attack directly from the longboat. A smart strategy to get the most out of a raid is to instead sneak in, assassinate the toughest enemies, like keep in mind you need advanced assassinations for that to work, but blow your horn, summon your dudes, then smash the necessary gates. For this strategy to work though, remember that you can always meditate and switch from day to night at will. Sneaking at night, unsurprisingly, a lot easier. More enemies are asleep, it's harder for them to detect you, there's just less dudes standing around. So after blowing the horn and busting the locks, Vikings pretty much have free reign of the place, so collect any wealth you missed and quickly escape. Certain wealth requires your crew's help to actually get, you can't just clear out a place on your own in a lot of cases, so eventually you are going to need to call in backup. So clearing out the toughest enemies first means your crew won't die quite so quickly, especially when you're having to do things like protecting them while they're breaking open some doors. This strategy does work really well for higher level locations once you've mastered it. You'll be able to start attacking places a lot tougher than yourself, and it's not going to be a whole lot of trouble. Just remember to sneak in, take out the high level targets, blow the horn, get the loot, lots safer than just going in. I mean, you don't have guns, but guns blazing, so to speak. And number seven is build your settlement. Once you arrive in England, you will get a short tutorial on building up your clan's new settlement. You might decide to put all this stuff on hold and just focus on playing through the story, but it's a better idea to get your settlement built up as early as you can for a couple important reasons. First big one is that building the Hidden Ones Bureau ends up saving you tons of time in the future. Building this structure unlocks the ability to hunt members of the Order of the Ancients, you know, what the Templars were before they called themselves the Templars, which is something you're eventually going to have to do anyways, so getting it built right away will help you find these guys as you're exploring and doing missions rather than having to take time specifically to hunt them down. Plus, it's worth doing so you can unlock some unique assassin abilities, like you know the Eagle Dive in every Assassin's Creed game that you need the Hidden Ones Bureau for. Really, a lot of the game's more interesting side quests are locked behind buildings at your settlement. If you don't build them, you miss out on them. And it's not just assassination stuff. There's contracts that you can fill, legendary animals to hunt, and you won't have access to any of it without building your settlement. At number six, and this, I mean, you wouldn't think of this as terribly important sounding, but upgrade your rations. Super basic, but seriously, upgrade this as soon as you possibly can. Of course, rations allow you to heal yourself in combat. The more ration upgrades you have, the better you can heal yourself. I mean, this is useful in literally any context, but if you're playing above the standard difficulty level, it is a lifesaver. On hard, it only takes a few hits, you go down, so having anything that can even the odds a little will make your Viking life a lot easier. To do this, you need two resources, iron ore and leather. You can find both of these just all over the place. It's pretty easy to get a lot of iron and leather if you're thorough about taking all the wealth from an area. The main issue with all this is that you want iron and leather for upgrading your equipment as well, but in my experience, it's better to put those resources into upgrading upgrading rations first. Smart thing to do, buy out as much of it as possible from every merchant you come across until you can upgrade your rations three or four times. Merchants will have plenty of both. They're pretty expensive at first, but it'll be worth it in the long run, I promise you this. Also, don't forget to sell off all your trade goods. They have literally no purpose other than to be sold. Just hit sell all, get rid of it, sink that crap into upgrading your rations three or four times. You probably don't need to rush to upgrade them any more than that, but if you're struggling in combat or feel like you just want more, then I guess go for it. It's a big help. At number five, believe it or not, there's a lot of interesting settings to check out. Like, obviously, there's adjustment of difficulty settings, but as usual with these types of things, it'd be hard to tell exactly how tough some of these options really are. The game splits difficulty into three settings, exploration, combat, and stealth. After some experimenting, these are some settings we definitely prefer over the rest. For exploration, Pathfinder is the hardest exploration difficulty level, and it's definitely the way to go. Previous games in the series, like Odyssey, included an option like this that didn't tell you exactly where quest objectives were, so you'd have to find them on the map. Personally, I like how exploration is handled just a little bit more with the uh, Pathfinder option. Just takes away the clutter. Nice thing about this game is that for main story quests, it still tells you where to go, but you don't get any big checkpoints floating around your screen. Everything you need to know is on the compass. That lack of clutter is the only major difference. Pathfinder mode seems pretty natural feeling, to me at least, and it fixes an annoying thing about the mode from Odyssey, which is that you'd have to constantly open up your world map and mark where you're going. For combat difficulty, we like Berserker or Hard. It's challenging, of course, at first at least, but once you get in the groove of how combat works, 
feels pretty natural. Things remain challenging, but not like overtly hard. You won't be dying in every encounter, but you'll need to be a little more cautious than in normal. For stealth, there's really only three difficulties, and the highest master assassin felt like it'd be a huge pain to deal with. Enemies spot you so fast, so if you play like purely as a combat game, sure, go for it. But standard assassin difficulty seems to be fine, in my opinion with stealth. As far as we can tell, the only thing that changes is how fast enemies notice you. There is kind of a hidden option for the type of person that gets annoyed about how you sometimes can't kill enemies instantly when you assassinate them. All the way at the bottom of the gameplay tab, there's an option called Guaranteed Assassination. Turn that on and every time you do an assassination, the target is killed. They warn you that it's not the way the game was intended to be played, but I think if you're turning it on, maybe you don't care. Maybe you don't really want to worry about your assassination level. Leave me alone. God. Number four, there is more exploration in this game. Like, it's a small thing, but for the first time in an Assassin's Creed game, not everything significant is marked on your map. Even if you find a vantage point and survey the area, get all the little wealth and mysteries pop up, certain things just remain unmarked. World events, boss enemies, and some unique stuff is just hidden out in the world, and no point is on your map to guide you to it. That means you see some location, like a cave or a building or a place that just looks interesting, there's probably something there. The fact the game is a little less clear about uh, markers is actually a breath of fresh air, and some of the most interesting encounters in the game are hidden this way, so if you see something in the distance that looks interesting but isn't marked, check it! Something's probably there, that's all I'm saying. And number three, there is a lot of breakable stuff. Might sound obvious, it's actually not. We don't usually see things like breakable walls and locks in Assassin's Creed games, so you might not be expecting it, but just keep an eye out for things you can break. There's soft walls, there's locks you can destroy, there's even breakable ice that may hide a secret behind it. Some of this will be highlighted red when you look at it, but a lot of it isn't. If you see something that looks like it might break but aren't sure, just aim at it and see if your reticle turns red. If it does, then yeah, you can break it. Probably the hardest things to break are these crumbling stone walls. Uh, you need some kind of explosive to open them. Oh, hi, Zelda. Uh, but look around for some nearby red pots that'll explode if you shoot them. If there isn't anything like that nearby, then you're going to have to get an ability. There's one called Incendiary Powder Trap which can be used to break these walls. So be on the lookout for books of knowledge to unlock this ability. While we are on the topic, it's a good idea to get as many books of knowledge as you can as early as you can. Some of these abilities are crazy good, incendiary powder trap included. So just hunt down any points of wealth that you can find and you'll come across these things. And number two, the bow and the torch make a powerful combo. We have already talked about how fire hurts if it hits you, but fire hurts your enemies just as much. It takes a while to unlock a skill that gets you flaming arrows, but you don't actually even need that. You can start fires already with the torch. You can equip a torch whenever you want. You can even use it as a weapon so you can throw it to set fire on stuff or just drop it on the ground. What's cool is if you aim your bow, walk up to a fire source, the arrow will light up and become a fire arrow. So all you really need is a simple torch. Just drop it on the ground, point your arrow at the flames, and hey, you got a fire arrow. At the end of the day, mostly this is just for fun, but the additional damage you do sometimes can really make things a lot easier. Certain high level enemies can be killed instantly with just two shots instead of three or four. So yeah, not the most useful for every situation, but it helps to remember that the torch can do more than just light up a dark place. You can also start fires with it. And finally, at number one, there is a cat you can get for your longboat. Yeah, in the town of Northwick, there's a cat you can talk to. This is a location you go during Oswald's story arc. When you approach it, it just runs away. But if you talk to the nearby kid, it'll start a short quest so you can get a sea cat that will appear on your longboat. It actually doesn't do anything. It's a cat after all, but it's a fun bonus. It's pretty easy to miss. That's all for now. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is a subscription. Click subscribe. Don't forget to enable all notifications. As always, thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. And we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.